Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, taking responsibility for one's own training. Um, now, like I said, if you, if you want to make any progress with well, any kind of activity, whatever it is, you do have to take some responsibility for it. I mean, one of the problems with things like the military or whatever is that people join the join the army, they go through basic training, and then there's this kind of, the whole life is kind of monitored and maintained, and yes, of course, they get reasonably good because they're being made to do it all the time. The big shift between, if you like, between a soldier and a warrior is that a warrior will take responsibility for his personal development and, um, and, and find his own path and choose his own action, whereas a soldier is always dependent upon orders and the context in which he's operating, and often you take him out of that, it just falls to pieces, um, and uh, you see. I don't know what happens in Sweden, but in England, there's a lot. Of, I think a, a remarkably high proportion of our prison population is basically ex-servicemen. Um, a because okay, there's a certain type of person that goes into the army, the certain experience that they have in the army, but then when they come out, a lot of them just can't cope without that structure, and they end up in, in prison. Probably quite comfortable there, because it's probably the nearest thing the, 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 the civilian life provides to the military, in, in a manner of speaking. Um, so, with training, yes, if you've got a class you can get to twice a week and you go along to that class and you do what you're told, you will probably get fairly good at whatever it is that's being taught there. That will probably happen. However, if you want to, that's actually, the trouble with that is that's almost the sort of um, martial arts or mind-body-spirit training equivalent of basically being a soldier. You're going along, undergoing the discipline and letting someone else, right, well, okay, you're turning up and you're paying, so that's not negligible, that's, I'm not going to knock that at all, but if all you're doing is doing what you're told in the class and you have no responsibility outside that, then you're one of these people who said, oh, I had a black belt 20 years ago, what can you do now? Oh, well, that was 20 years ago. Well, why didn't you keep, if you kept your practice up, you may actually have achieved something quite interesting. Oh, well, I didn't go to classes anymore, so it stopped happening. Okay, your choice, but it's a bit of a waste if you think about it. So with STARV, we're much more interested in the um, personal responsibility and your personal development, partly because teachers are fairly few and far between and rather widely spread, and partly because even if you are able to get to a class regularly, which the people of Crewkern and surrounding area are, though very few of them do, um, I still want people to be able to take responsibility for it, because I might... One day I will I'll certainly die one day, I could move away, I might, there's all sorts of things that could happen. And if people are going to, if it's going to become part of people's lives, you've got to integrate that, you've got to internalise it, you've got to take personal responsibility for it. And um, for some reason people find that remarkably difficult, and I want to try and address some of the issues that make it difficult and perhaps some of the solutions to that. Firstly, um, as I said, what we looked at earlier was remembering to keep things as simple as possible. And if um, Starve, as I said, we had this idea of it being kind of devotion to the cult of Heimdall, um, which I rather like that idea, um, the symbol of Heimdall is the, it's the Hargle, as we were looking at. And having... Um, and with the Hargle rune, you've got everything you need in there to remind you about personal training. Uh, and basically, you're interested in working with the centre line, you're interested in working with the angle lines, interested in the centre. And we looked at, you can narrow that down to three exercises, downward strike, angle strike, and thrusting to the centre. And basically, at the end of the day, all of the universe is built on this fundamental structure. So if you can start working with that, you've got the fundamentals to, to, to build on from there. Um, that's the first thing. We actually we have the video of how we train with that, and that can be addressed separately. The second uh, thing that where people go wrong is, and it becomes a problem, is that we have this tendency in the West, um, and I guess it's happening all over the world, to be perfectly honest, uh, to collect and accumulate and burden ourselves down with just too much of everything. You know, we know that's a modern problem. Uh, it's not exactly a new problem. If you know, I think it's in the Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament. It says, of the making of the many books, there is no end. And then he says, oh, how wearying it is 
the fact that these books exist. And that's like the Old Testament times when they actually had to write everything down by hand. Even then people felt there was too many books around and too much material and too much information. So if that was, what would you think now? You know. Um, so this is an ongoing problem. So the ability to, to simplify, which obviously that is an extremely simple diagram, sim simple way of putting it, uh, is essential. And um, one of the teachings that has developed in the last, well, recently, I mean it, it goes back a hundred years or more, but has sort of in the last few years has become more widely known, and say I'm disseminating it now if you're not familiar with it, um, is the principle of the 80-20 principle, or Pareto's Law. And um, it's called Pareto's Law because an uh, a, a Italian um, uh, economist in about the, sometime in the like, second half of the 19th century, um, called Pareto, I can't remember his Christian name, you can look it up, um, noticed the fact that, um, he, that, 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 it, that it seemed to be that in any given society or community, country, whatever, 80% of the wealth was in the hands of 20% of the people, if not 90% in the hands of 10%. It was always in that sort of order. And he thought, this is very odd. He said, okay, that applies in, it in Italy. Um, uh, I can, he could establish that. I wonder if that's just an Italian thing or it's the same everywhere. So he actually investigated lots of different countries and found that in every case, that was the wealth distribution. He went um, into, uh, into history and he found that through most of history that had been the wealth distribution. Uh, and then it became an interesting kind of economic sort of fact, but not a great deal else. Then in the post-war period, there was a, I think his name was Dura, there's a, um, a Romanian, he was a Romanian but lived in America, engineer, actually kind of stumbled across this principle and thought, well, it's very interesting from an economic point of view, but does it apply to anything else? And he started looking around at the idea of 80% of something coming from, or results, coming from 20% of, of input. And he actually realised that actually it did. Um, and uh, he wrote a, a book, I think, called something, it's something called like 80-20 Quality Control or something. And he realised if you're going to improve something, 80% of the problems that are coming from a product or a service or whatever it is are actually going to be coming from a very small proportion of the potential problems that could arise and, um, and vice versa the benefits. Now that means that if a, um, if a, if a policeman, if, a, if you take a police force and you actually took arrests and you know, convictions and the whole people, all the people in that police you, department, you'd find that 80% of the convictions were actually coming from 20% of the policemen. Um, if you look at, uh, you know, in school, a school situation, that 20% of the um, really, really good results, sorry, 80% of the really, really good results are going to be coming from a very small proportion of the actual children in that school. Vice versa, most of the bad behaviour and problems is going to be created by a very small proportion of children. Which means that a very small degree of action or small change in something has massively disproportionate effects and the benefits. And you can test this in your own life extremely easily. The easiest way to test it is porridge. You make porridge in the morning, and when you're ready to serve up your porridge, you hold the pan over the cup and you go one scrape with the spoon, boom, and then have a look at how much porridge has come out. And then see how much effort it takes to get the rest of the porridge out. You can get 80% of the porridge out with just one scoop of the spoon. Getting all the rest of the porridge out, you're going to have to scrape it, scrape it, scrape it, then you have to soak it in water, then you have to wash it, and you're going to clean it out and dry it. And so getting the, the last 20% or even the last 5% of the porridge out of that pan is a phenomenal amount of work. Getting the, all the porridge you need to eat comes out in one go. Well, there's, a, there's a really good book called The 80-20 Principle. Is it, uh, oh, Richard Koch, that's it. Yeah, there you go. Uh, right, so we're going to... So, um, the, so the second thing to think about with our personal training, apart from the simplicity, the simplicity of the Hargle Rune, is the idea of 80-20. And if you want to read the book about that, it's by Richard Koch. But there's an awful lot of people who are doing work in all kinds of fields now 
um, whether it's I'm, I'm applying it to martial arts. I don't know how many other people are doing that, but um, and mind body spirit training, um, but in all kinds of fields that people are actually applying this principle, and um, it's becoming very widespread. So if you actually were to do some Google searching on 80-20 principle, Pareto's law, you'll find loads of articles and stuff out there. And like I said, you don't need to. The book is good. It's a very good book, but like I said, 80% of it's redundant. To be honest, by definition. Um, okay, so how do you apply that to your training? Well, again, it comes back to this in a funny sort of way, because um, the web is um, one, two, three lines, one, two, three, one, almost there, two, three. So the web, um, the full web has nine lines, and we're going to be looking at working with this with the um, cudgel a little bit later. But even that can be simplified down to about a third of its, take one of those out, is that 20% of it? I don't know how you, how, exactly how you measure that, but even this very simple idea can be simplified down into that. So always look for the simplest way of doing things. And like I said, we tend to appreciate or accumulate uh, loads and loads of stuff. So when you go to a karate class or a martial arts class or something, or even doing a staff class, we've got you know, five or six different weapons that we can use. We've got, um, you know, drills that we can use with all of those. Um, and it's already got far too complicated. Now, obviously, if you're running a, a regular week at a class, you want a bit of variety, you want to have a bit of fun, you want to have some interest, you want to have a bit of challenge in it. So that's actually good, but it's not necessary. So you need to be able to kind of constrict and expand your training depending upon what the time you have available. Now, we said before that there's three things in staff that are of importance. There's um, stances, there's um, uh, the, the web, and then there's, there's the principles. And the stances should be done on a daily basis, if that's your irreducible minimum. So if you're going to um, practice staff, you want to do the stance on a daily basis. Now, working with the web, um, well, the Hargle, the Hargle room comes out of the web. So basically the striking actions with that are actually working with the lines of the web. I'll put web lines to make it slightly clearer what I mean there. Principles. Um, Again, uh, if you can train with somebody else, then we looked yesterday at very simple drills for working with principles. At the end of the day, it comes down to how you move the body. There isn't a great deal more to it than that. So um, you need to be able to move, act, and, and realise an objective. And um, that can be, and again, you can minimise the way of doing that. So you can have the stances, you can have three cuts and a thrust, two cuts and a thrust. And then you can actually have just literally thinking about stepping back, if it's a trail response, stopping somebody with a car response, um, taking control of somebody, and you can actually do it almost by a role play action, or even just by observing what's going on in the world around you about what kind of interaction, what, it, what, at what level is that interaction on. There's a lot of ways of sort of being aware of the principles and developing that awareness. Um, so you need to sort of be able to, to sort of say, when I've got five minutes a day or yeah, five minutes a day to train and practice my staff, what can I do? Well, you can do the stances fairly quickly. You can, we're talking about nine breaths, seven breaths at the beginning. Just do two breaths, do three breaths, one breath. If you need to, if you really are that short of time, you know, do literally just do one, you know, bow, one breath, bang, get straight into the stances. Do them fast, one, two. It's not as good. But get them done. You know that's your eighty twenty. If you can hold on to a practice um, on a daily basis, uh, or a, yeah, it does have to be daily, really. If you can hold on to the practice on a daily basis, even if it's in a very, very, very tiny form, you know that level, it can be expanded again. I'm going to come back to expansion again at the moment. Um, once you let it go, it's disappeared. It's a little bit like you know a fire can be a raging bonfire, or it can be a tiny little sort of coal that's kept in something and just kept going. It doesn't really matter which it is, it's still fire. And it can be, that fire can be killed, kindled into something big, uh, or again it can come back to just that one little coal that you look after. But once that's gone out, 
you really have got a problem. You've got to start all over again. Okay, today we have lighters and matches and all kinds of stuff. But going back in history, I mean, people virtually had to wait for the next lightning strike, you know, before and hopefully they could catch the fire before that happened. I mean, yes, people did develop technology. But you ever tried lighting a fire with friction? I mean, you know, uh, you know, our um, friend Nigel <laughs> teaches how to do that. He's got very good at it. He's practiced for years. He's worked out the kit you need, the different woods you need, and how to do it. And he'll teach a session where it generally happens that people will get there but it's not easy it is not easy um, and it's the same with losing your practice losing your training if once you let it go um, it's an awful lot of effort getting that going again um, so you, you hang on to something even if it's very very small you know like a I don't know, part of do, do six stances in a day and then do the other two sets in the following days but just don't let it, don't lose it, don't lose it completely. Um, then you've got to bear in mind this idea of so expansion and contraction. You don't need to be afraid of being squeezed through a bottleneck. You, in fact, it's often that's a good time to, to lose a lot of stuff you don't need. Because one of the big problems that people have again with training, and I think they did this with yoga, they did with all sorts of stuff, is that they... They say, oh, I've got a year, I do an hour's yoga every day, every morning, I get up at five o'clock, I do an hour's yoga, and I, I, and I get my outfit on, and I have my mat out, and I light my incense, and I, I do my meditation, and I do my fantastic yoga session. I think, actually, wonderful. Let's ask you in a year's time where you are with that. And a year later, you often say to them, how's the yoga going? Oh, I had to give that up, I had to, I, I, know, I had a baby, I had to sort of get to, I changed my job, uh, whatever, whatever, I, I couldn't get up at five o'clock in the morning anymore. I said, well, why did you give it up? And they go, well, I didn't have time. I was like, well, no, I, I'm not the question I asked. Why did you give up your yoga practice? Well, I didn't have an hour a day at five in the morning to do my... I said, well, couldn't you have done two, you know, ten minutes yoga? Couldn't you have done one minute yoga? Oh, and they don't seem to understand what you're talking about. It's either completely all or there's nothing. I said, well, isn't there, like, one key... What's the word they use? Asana, is it? The, the, the yeah. posture? Yeah. What about... Wasn't the one key asana that you could do... In ordinary clothes, the one that you could do in ordinary clothes, I mean, some of them, yes, you need a light or on or whatever because you're doing such funny bizarre postures. There must be one, like, one yoga position that you could do in ordinary clothes anywhere in the house while you were, I don't know, boiling the kettle. And they, if, and, and, and that's, they can't get their heads around that. And yet, that, if you think about it, would be the way to go. And that would have been, they say, well, what's your yoga practice? Well, my yoga practice today was whatever. And at one movement, it was like, no. That was it. Now that keeps the connection. That keeps the thread. It keeps the. It's what you can drag through that bottleneck with you. And because, but it's like that. It's like a seed that can be planted, and from which you may eventually have a whole field of whatever again. It's the tree, or that grows again. It's the fire that can be rekindled. And um, it's the same with stuff. I mean, people just drop the practice like they drop so much else because they haven't actually been able to find the 20 or 10 or 5 or 1, actually about, and it could be 99, 1, actually. No, no, I mean, no one says, no one ever claims this number is absolute. It can be between 70 and 30 and 99 and 1. Um, I think 1 is the I mean, you can argue about fractions, but let's say 99, 1. If you can keep that one thing alive, if that one thing complete, that one coal burning, that one seed that can be germinated again, you've always got the chance of recovering it. That's a story in the, um, that reminds me of course of the um, otter, the otter's gold, um, that the, when they, when Avadi, uh, when, when Loki went and found the, the dwarf Avadi, is that his name? Andvare. What? Andvare. Andvare, sorry, yeah, that's it, yeah. Um, Loki knew where to go to, he found him, he caught him, he said, we need to take all your gold. The guy wasn't actually all that bothered. He said, well, you know, I can always get more, it's no problem. Yeah, take the gold, he's not worried about that. But we want that one as well. Ah, oh, that's the ring that enables me to create the one. Oh, we have to have that one as well. You take that one, I'm going to curse it. Because when you take that from me, you've taken everything. And that was the issue. Now, obviously, where Loki should have stopped. That's where the, you kill the golden goose, if you like, that lay, kill the, gale, the, the, the goose that lays the golden eggs, as the expression goes, you know, from the fairy story. Um, so if you can keep that one tiny thing, that ring, what all the things I've mentioned, and you, th therefore you've always got the chance of reconstructing it and re-expanding it again. Um, again, I sometimes sort of say that if you're washed up naked on a desert island, or if you're put in a high-security prison, 
your staff should be there with you because it's actually something that's carried in here and in here and if you can do the stances or even think of the stances think of the process then it's you've still got it it can't be taken away from you unless you let it go you know it's it's always it's always there um so that's the idea of reducing it down and then then this is the idea of re-expanding it um, you have the idea of the sort of a word links to word, a deed links to deed, so I prospered and grew in wisdom idea. So if you've hung on to that tiny bit, once you start using it again, once you start doing that kind of practice we were doing this morning, you could from that create a whole martial arts training system quite easily. I mean, I effectively, I mean, Ivar effectively did that. I mean, he learned the stances and then he learned these you know, five movements, which we're not quite sure exactly what he knew before he went to Japan and what he knew afterwards. But that was basically it. And then by kind of not forgetting those, going to Japan, saying to the instructors there, help me recreate this, he was able to come back with the ability to teach martial arts, which of course he had when he came back from Japan. From Japan. And then from that, we then worked with it to create, the, you know, with the idea of working with the webs, stances, web principles, and we were able to then create a, I think is a pretty workable martial arts training system, which is still growing and it's still developing. And what I have to then remember is that A, to let other people do what they want with it and see what they can make of it. And also remember not to over accumulate it into this area or rather, if you, as I say, if you go 99 you know, to 1, I have to bear in mind the fact that's the only bit that really matters and if that lot has to be lost or someone hasn't got time to practice it or I've got to be willing to sort of let that go at any time because otherwise you just burden it down and it sinks under its own weight like everything else does. If people can't decide which bit matters then when they go through the bottleneck for whatever reason they leave everything behind. So I'm going to go, that's the ring that enables me to get the rest, that's one that's going with me, I can now recreate everything. It's like, I don't know which one's important, so I don't let go of any of it, so you end up like Fafnir, who's the dragon, the big fat dragon just sort of sitting there on all of it, waiting for someone to kill him, which is what happens. Um, or you end up, you know, or, you, or you're willing to let all that go because you're confident you can recreate it when you get to the other side. Let's just put that down as sort of deed leads to deed, and then you can kind of... If you want to put a note, that's in there. You can look it up and have a note yourself. <coughs> okay, so you, the other thing you have to take responsibility for is overcoming the ego. Um, now, again, this is a, another vast subject, but um, if you work on the idea of the uh, conscious mind, I think what sort of model you're using, really, uh, but the, the ego is the sense of self, it's the part of our mind that gives us our sense of self, and it's the part of us that is also afraid of change because it's afraid of losing that sense of self, or rather the self exists on various levels. Now obviously the, the true uh, soul or real, real you can't actually ever be destroyed, changed, uh, maybe it survives into future lives, that's another slightly different matter. Um, but whether or not, I'm not actually, that's not what I'm talking about here. Um, the true essence of self is indestructible, uh, it's infinite, depending on how you understand that concept, um, and also has this infinite capacity for accessing wisdom and growth and development. The ego is the sense of self that comes from our upbringing, our conditioning, our social setting. And it's important because obviously we need a certain sense of identity of who we are, where we fit into the world, um, who we care about, who cares about us. And the ego, you know, responds to that, our cultural context and everything else. But it's as much a trap as it is a benefit. And that's the, thing, the important thing to remember. Now, when you train in this sort of stuff, um, you are basically confronting the ego, and the ego resists it, because on the one level the ego kind of might have an idea that I am the kind of person who, who does this sort of stuff and is good at it and, um, and wants to do it, and that's probably why you got involved in the first place. If the ego didn't have the sense that it was, well, I am the kind of person that learns this and masters it and gets good at it and, you know, blah, blah, you wouldn't be here. 
The problem is that once you get into it, change happens, and then the ego starts saying, no, no, we're the sort of person that already knows how to do this. We're not the sort of person that changes in doing this or has the humility to accept the fact that we're learning something new. And that's when the resistance starts to come up. And I don't have an answer to say that you won't experience that, but you need to be aware of it. So there's problems of time, there's problems of effort, uh, there's problems of knowledge, um, and there's problems of the ego being afraid to change and afraid of the change that comes through training. And that's natural, but it's also very limiting and very destructive. And you will have to sort of observe that effect, observe the ego saying, oh, you don't really want to train today, you don't want to do that, you haven't got time, and you, you don't want to make this effort, it's not worth it. You've got to observe the ego doing that, and either accept the fact, no, no, I'm someone who doesn't change to be right, or, sod that, let's go out and do it, this is a battle. Because we often talk about, you know, this is training for defeating demons and dragons and giants and all that sort of stuff. Well, believe me, if a giant or a dragon or a demon came along, you'd have a hell of an easier time fighting that than you were actually fighting the inner one of, the, of your own ego. That's the strange part. I mean, they're easy to fight, those are monsters, because all you've got to do is just stick a big spear in it, and you may or may not, either you're dead or it is. End of story. The ego is a lot more insidious and more diff and difficult to struggle with. Which is why, again, we talk about this practice it will equip you for dealing with the world, dealing with life, but first you have to defeat the, the biggest demon, which is the one, your ego, which is saying, ah, don't bother doing this, you don't need this, you can't handle this, or this is a waste of time, whatever. If, if, and, and then you, and you have to make that choice, which way that goes. So you've got to defeat the ego. Um, which then brings me to my last point, and I will make this brief. Therefore, the only method by which you defeat the ego is with practice. You commit yourself to a practice. And if, you, if it helps to see it this way, you commit yourself to the, um, to the cult. You, know, you commit yourself to the cult of Heimdall, which is the cult of, which is the, or the, the, you devote yourself to the... Um, uh, honouring, I think it's worship because I suppose if you use worship in its most in its most basic form and the way we express it is, is giving the worth of something. So it's so when you worship something, you acknowledge its worth. So you say, I acknowledge the worth of God, and um, that's that is worship. It is it is acknowledging the worth of God. You might do it with songs, you might do it with prayers, you might do it with hymns, you might do it with readings, uh, you might do it with sacrifices. I guess you always do it with sacrifice. So I suppose if you talk about the worship of the cult of Heimdall, it's the it's taking the Hagel rune and then it's seeing the worth of creating that or working with that Hagel, with the Hagel and practicing that worship or the devotion to Hagel, which is the practice of seeing the lines, creating the web. Uh, developing technical skill, knowledge, and everything else. Um, it's, it's, so that's so it's a kind of yeah, it's an intellectual, but it's physical. It's manual. It's it's creative uh, process. But there has to be a daily practice of that, as I said earlier. And that practice might be that tiny little spark of literally a minute a day. I mean, do the hard room. That would, okay, maybe that's it. I don't know. It's up to you. Work it out. I've got my own level of training and, and practice that works for me. Um, and I fit that into my life, so which is, you know, I've managed to do that. Um, you have to take responsibility for this. There's no point in me telling you what to do and saying, you must go away and do this and do this and do this and you'll get that and that and that will happen. I don't know. I can't say that's for sure. You, you've got your lives. I don't know anything about most of your lives. Um, but I'm so, you, you can, you've got to be looking at this and saying... A, do I want to do this? B, am I willing to confront my ego and establish a practice? And am I conscious of the idea of 80-20 or even 99 to 1, which means that sometimes I'm going to be able to do a lot, but as deed leads to deed, word leads to word, and sometimes I'm also going to be able to cope with the fact that life is actually constricting me and actually pushing me right down to nothing. Am I still going to honour my devotion to 
I'm dull by at least doing something that is that acknowledges that Hargle rune. Even if it's just doing the Hargle, just doing the stance, maybe the one stance in a day. That's all you've got time for, all this opportunity. You haven't forgotten it, you haven't lost your practice, you've actually still done enough to maintain the, uh, the development of it. Um, otherwise, it's down to you, oh, oh, and apart from that, it's, it's down to you. Oh, it's down to you. <laughs>